I'm really excited about giving this talk because I think we're incredibly lucky here at UW. Um, we now have um, kind of two or three basic neuro, uh, neuroimaging centers that are focused on research. And we have this huge neuroimaging community that's focused on you know, everything from very translational applications to extremely basic applications. Um, but like the curse of all really big, strong institutions is that we don't talk to each other enough. Um, and we don't, and often, you know, I've had this experience where I go to conference and find someone who's in my own university who's doing something that's really relevant to me. And so I'm going to talk less about my own research in this talk um, than talk about kind of what's happening kind of on the arts and sciences campus. Um, and of course, equally exciting things are happening in the medical school. But what I'm trying to do is they kind of kind of walk you across the bridge virtually. Um, and tell you kind of some of the things we're doing over here. And with the hope that if you guys are interested in doing neuroimaging, kind of using the Siemens scanner rather than, you know, so there's basically sort of what's up and starting a conversation. I must admit, when I signed up for this talk, I thought I was talking to the Neurosciences Institute and it was going to be a very broad audience. And so I called this a simple introduction to advances in neuroimaging. And then I realized I'm talking to neurosurgery and radiology. So I've changed this to a brief introduction to advances in neuroimaging with human brain. And the other thing I've done is I've brought in John Piles, who's the director of our um, Center for Human Neuroscience at the Imaging Center. Um, because I think he's in a much better position to explain to you kind of what the advances are on acquisition and what is kind of the NUNIH mandates are about um, data sharing. And so that brings me to our slide. And he'll introduce himself as I pass over to him. But this way, you know, I'm not talking about things that I basically rely on John to guide me on. Um, so the, basically the talk has been three parts. The first part, John is going to talk about kind of advances in MRI, how we can do things now that we couldn't do five or 10 years ago. I'm then going to provide a few case studies of how people in UW are mainly in the arts and sciences campus are using this for research. And I think I've chosen examples that hopefully will be relevant to your research as I'm assuming that most of you are translational clinicians. And then finally, I'm going to pass it back to John to talk about data sharing as an NIH priority um, and how we deal with large, and the fact that we're now dealing with larger and larger data sets and how we manage those. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to John to fill in any gaps um, in what I haven't heard about and what we're going to do. Over to you, John. We were very lucky to recruit John. We stole him from Carnegie Mellon. Um, and Jeff, my husband Jeff was one of the other centers. Is, is I think that's sort of he feels like that was his drop the mic moment in getting the center started and really up and rolling and um, successful. And it really has meant that we've had fewer teething difficulties than we ever expected to have. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you. That's that's very kind. Um, yeah. So I'm John Piles. I'm the um, associate director of the Center for Human Neuroscience. I basically. Um, run the scanner. Um, I was an undergraduate here at UW, so I'm back after about 22 years, which is fantastic to be back. Um, my undergrads were actually in philosophy and history of science, and then I went into cognitive neuroscience. Uh, my PhD is in cognitive neuroscience from UC Irvine, so that's, I'm not an MR physicist, I am a cognitive neuroscientist, but I got into MRI pretty early, and I'm interested in technical aspects of MRI. Uh, my research itself is on high-level vision, social perception, uh, face perception, object perception. That's what I do um, in my own line of research. Um, so after a while at Carnegie Mellon as a postdoc and a research scientist, I'm here back at UW uh, running the center and very happy to be here. So I'm just going to give you maybe a quick five-minute overview um, as to kind of what the advances, some of the advances have been made in specifically MRI over the last 10 or so years and how that lets us do uh, the work in the case studies that I'm going to talk about. And then at the end, I'll wrap up with a little bit about data sharing and standardization and the new NIH mandate for data sharing. Um, so we're going to go on to the next slide, Ioni. Um, a lot of what has given us the um, advance we've had in, in MRI is a three kind of major hardware advances. So the first I would say is the Kind of standardization now at three Tesla as the field strength for both clinical and research MRI. Um, 1.5 Tesla is, of course, still very prevalent, but for research, we've kind of standardized um, on uh, 3T and also for advanced clinical applications as well. And then with 7T uh, being also FDA approved and waiting in the wings. 
Um, we have sort of advanced gradient systems and RF systems that have kind of let us do um, more powerful acquisition for diffusion imaging and equiplanar imaging and uh, more sophisticated RF transmission. But kind of, I think the real key to what has allowed a lot of the advances in uh, acquisition and thus analysis and what we can do with MRI in the last about 15 years are multi-channel phased array head coils. Uh, next slide. And the multi-channel coils are essentially exactly what they sound like. So um, instead of a single birdcage coil, which might be the kind of MRI uh, head coil you had circa 2001, 2002, where you had basically one antenna that was around the head, we now have what are called phased array head coils, where it's essentially an array of surface coils um, that uh, surround the head or also uh, um, other body parts, depending on what you're imaging. But we're going to focus on uh, neuroimaging of the brain uh, in this talk today. So here are just a couple examples of both the outside and the guts inside of what these coils look like. So the standard for a lot of research now is a 32-channel coil. Um, that you can see on the left the Siemens 32-channel coil. There's also a Philips 32. Uh, we also have the Siemens 64 head neck. And then there's been a lot of development in coil design, especially at MGH and uh, other places for adding even more coils. So you can see down there on the bottom right, a prototype for a 90 channel coil um, uh, from our colleagues at MGH. Uh, next slide. So what do we get from these phased array head coils? Well, the first is that we get increased signal to noise ratio. Because this is an array of service coils that is quite close to the brain, especially the cortex, we can see a very substantial increase in signal to noise ratio just by no other, nothing else than just the coil being uh, closer to the source of the signal. So as I have shown here, I have two different SNR diagrams on one from Siemens. So this is the difference even just between a 20 channel. So we're already with a phased array multi-channel head coil to a 64 channel. You can get up to a 52 increase in overall SNR. And then actually at the cortex, you can see around you know the edge of the head and the brain, we can get a 92% increase in SNR. And this allows us to do really great things with functional MRI and other imaging protocols. The other thing we have with these multi-phase array head coils is this extra spatial information from each individual coil sensitivity. So you can see on the right how we have, in this case, just four coils around a sphere. And you see down in C that um, those different coils have different sensitivities. So you have a brighter spot for where each coil is at. And that allows us to do some very important things that advances in neuroimaging. Uh, next slide. Um, specifically, we can now do parallel imaging acceleration. So this was the first advance, I would say circa, oh, about 2005 or so, where eight channel, um, 12 channel coils came in um, to use. And what those, what we can do with a, these multiple coils is that we can actually undersample case space. We can undersample our imaging space, which, and then use the sensitivity profiles of those different coils because they are overlapping in the information they're receiving and some fancy math in there to basically fill in the gaps using the sensitivity profiles, of those different coils that can generate then images from those individual coils and then combine into a final image, combining 8, 12, 64 different coils together into a final brain image. Now, that final image is the combination again of those 64 images, but we're undersampling those 64 images from the individual coils. And that means we can either go faster or we can image at the same speed and high resolution. So this was parallel imaging acceleration, which you might've heard of called either GRAPA or SENSE, depending on the scanner manufacturer. This is kind of the first step in using these coils to um, improve substantially um, the quality of our scans um, and the speed of our scans we can do. For us who do functional MRI, uh, next slide. <clears throat> the really cool thing though, which was uh, more recently, so about the last 10 years, is uh, the invention of multiband or simultaneous multi-slice echoplanar imaging. So when we are doing functional MRI, which is kind of the bread and butter of what um, Ioni and I do, um, that is echoplanar pulse imaging, um, the same thing with diffusion imaging. So in both of those sequences, we're acquiring just one slice of brain at a time traditionally. And that's pretty slow because we have to scan through the entire brain to get an entire brain volume to collect a data point. Um, what multiband lets us do is basically do multiple slices at once. And again, this is only possible because we have these phased array multi-channel head coils, specifically really 
20 channel and above head coils lets us do this multi-slice imaging pretty well. And this has been uh, a huge benefit to functional MRI and also diffusion MRI because uh, it's almost as close as you can get, um, in my experience, to free lunch in MRI. Usually in MRI, it's always a trade-off. If you turn one knob, you're going to lose something in a, on, um, somewhere else. But with multiband, we can actually go a lot faster for not a lot of hit into noise ratio or artifact, which is um, pretty impressive and a, and a really kind of big deal for us who do a cognitive neuroscience. Um, so next slide. So one of the main things this lets us do is just go much faster at higher resolution. So on the left here would be a, a bold MRI sequence from maybe um, 2005, 2006, where in two seconds we could get about 30 slices of the brain at about three millimeter resolution, which is you know not bad, um, but the 30 slices might not cover the entirety of, a, of a, a large brain. You might miss cerebellum. You might have to you know, make a number of choices in terms of trade-off of your imaging. Now with multiband, we can very easily get two millimeter isovoxyl resolution in a two second TR, 72 slices with plenty of room to spare, only with accelerating our scan by about a factor of three. And if we wanted to go really fast, for example, like the Human Connectome Project, we could get an entire brain at two millimeters in about 800 milliseconds. So that's a lot faster at a more substantial resolution, that two millimeter being kind of the sweet spot for 3T. And this has been a, a, you know, a, a big advance, um, a substantial contribution in what we've been able to do in the last few years for uh, cognitive neuroscience and uh, neuroimaging. Uh, next slide. So that's let us do, among other things, um, it's been made a big contribution to MVPA, which we're not going to talk about much today, but this is, again, getting beyond doing univariate analysis of bold signal in certain brain regions to looking at how actual information is encoded in the brain. And to do that, we need individual voxel information with good signal to noise ratio and high reliability. And it turns out at 3T, two millimeter isovoxel is about the sweet spot for that. So multiband has been a boon for MVPA analysis. It lets us collect great data for doing those kinds of analyses. Because we can go faster, we can do, do increase our sampling rate of our bold signal. So now we can do also um, cool things like advanced trial-based analyses, uh, doing much more detailed mapping of the bold signal and or deconvolution analysis of rapid event-related designs where we have lots of stimuli being presented um, quickly. And so that's increasing the efficiency of the acquisition of our, of our imaging. Uh, next slide. Um, Beyond uh, another kind of side effect of this multiband and these um, increased uh, computationally intensive pulse sequences is that scanner manufacturers now have also had to add in more computational power to the scanner itself. So uh, our Siemens Prisma at CHN, and I think also the Philips over uh, uh, in radiology, they now have GPUs. So the same things you do deep learning, those graphics card processors are used to reconstruct the data. And that means you can get your data almost in real time, even with using these advanced compression and acceleration techniques. And that lets you do a number of things. A couple of things that are really great for pediatric imaging, which might be of interest. So for example, there's navigator guided T1 and T2 scans, which were from the ABCD study. Uh, this allows us to improve motion artifacts. Basically, we're guiding each excitation pulse in a T1 and T2 scan to make sure that it aligns with the previous pulse. If it doesn't align, we're going to toss it out and add another one to the end. Um, we can also do things like outputting the data in real time to peripheral instruments, um, such as FIRM, which is a monitoring system for motion, which lets us see the participant motion almost in real time, how they're, how they're doing. Um, next slide. Along with that also, there have been cool peripherals too, like uh, improvements in mock scanners that have come along to the ride. So this is our mock scanner uh, over at CHN on the left and our real scanner on the right, which are, which are pretty close, which we're kind of happy with. Uh, next slide. And the other big advance with this multi-slice uh, multi-band imaging is acceleration in diffusion weighted imaging. So diffusion weighted imaging has come a long way from back in the 90s when we just did a six direction tensor model. Now we are often doing high angular resolution multi-cell sequences, but these took a really long time to acquire even when I started by postdoc um, you know, 12 years ago. So we were acquiring a scan, which was a 257 direction diffusion spectrum imaging sequence. And it took us 43 minutes to acquire that scan, which is a huge amount of time for research um, and an intractable amount of time almost always for clinical. 
Now with multiband imaging, we can do that same scan at higher resolution in about 11 minutes, which makes it tractable both for research and then also potentially for clinical use. So that's one of the really big advances um, is this improved speed and diffusion acquisition. And that lets us next slide do um, improvements to our diffusion models. So instead of having um, simple tensor models, we can now do orientation diffusion models, which allow us to help us solve a crossing problem in diffusion. Uh, next slide. Um, which improves our tractography, um, lets us do things we were not able to do before, um, especially those critical intersection points were much easier or allows us to resolve those more easily now and do uh, whole uh, brain tractography. Uh, next slide. And I think at that point, any on diffusion, um, I'm going to pass it back over to Ioni, who's going to actually talk about some really cool work that uh, Ariel Rokum uh, here at UW has done with um, digging in deeper to the properties of tractography and uh, diffusion MRI. Thanks so much. Um, I think I'm going to hold all the questions to the end. So if you have any questions for John about specific protocols, then hold up on it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just talk about like four examples of kind of using these techniques. Um, in most cases, I'm using an example from UW. Um, Go Huskies. I'm using one because it's my favorite study and it's not actually from UW. Um, so the first one is using advanced um, diffusion techniques to examine the effects of prematurity. And um, this is done by Ariel Rokem, who's a new faculty member here in our psychology department. Now, this data that was collected, not connected at, not collected at UW, it was collected as part of the um, Human Baby Connectome Project, but it's an example of kind of using these sequences and the analysis and software that he's using is, is UW beta. So the basic idea is um, developed from an idea of um, Jason Yeatman, who um, is now at Stanford, but this was developed when he was at UW. He did all this best work at UW. He's just gone downhill since he's gone to Stanford. Um, so here we have a tract here. Um, well, the idea is to go beyond sort of just measuring tracks and looking at sort of the probability of two endpoints joining and to say, OK, what we're really interested in is the health of the white matter along this tract. Jason was interested in respect to reading. He was interested in whether he could find differences in these white matter tracks that would predict reading difficulty. But the general method is kind of very generally applicable to a lot of um, disorders. So essentially, you identify a tract using sort of standard kind of modern tractography techniques. And then you essentially take nodes along the middle of the tract. And the idea is to kind of get the points that are kind of right in the middle of that tract. And then you can measure a property, any property you want, really, along the middle of that tract. So when he began, he began by measuring fractional anisotropy, which is essentially a measure of the degree to which water is diffusing along the tract rather than orthogonal to the tract. And it's sort of meant to be a kind of measure of the sort of myelination of the tract or the strength of the tract. And you can measure that all the way along the tract. And so the idea is, is that subtle differences that might not affect kind of what the tract looks like in terms of sort of deterministic or probabilistic tractography may nonetheless be observable if you're actually looking at the microstructural properties of the tract along its length. And so this is an example of two tracts, the arcuate and the pelosi and forceps major, and what he has is sort of group differences along the tract and standard errors of those values along the tract. And what you can see is often these tracts do diff, sometimes they're pretty constant along the tract length, sometimes the properties differ across the tract length, but you now have something where you can sort of start looking at group differences um, at a very micro level. Um, in, and so Ariel took this approach. Um, in this case, he's using babies, um, really little babies. They're still look like raisins. Um, Jeff calls it whenever, my husband, whenever we get a picture of a newborn baby, he calls it the raisin picture because they look like small raisins with hats on. So this is a raisin and he's put in an MRI, teeny weeny weeny little MRI coil, which is the cutest thing ever. And this is all data from the Developing Human Connectome Project, which you can find here. And the tracks were analyzed using MR tricks and sort of in-house software that were developed specifically for tractography in babies, um, which is again kind of UW, a UW pipeline, which you can find here. And they basically measure, measure all these tracks in the babies um, and aut automatically identify each of these tracks. And that itself was, I think, quite a lot of work. 
And then what they're interested in is sort of the development of myelination across the tract. And they're, instead of using fractional isotropy in the study, they actually chose to use the T1 weighted over the T2 weighted image. And the intuition for this kind of measure is that the T1 weighted image um, is brighter where you have more myelin and more iron. The T2 weighted is brighter where you have more iron, less bright when you have more myelin. So if you put them on top of each other, you should get something that's kind of highly correlated with the myelin content along the tract. So they're using this measure along the tract. Um, and so here's an example of a tract, the Fusept minor. I have no idea what this tract is because it's here in front of the head and I only know about the back of the head, but it's a kind of nice example of this. And he's measuring this in three data sets. The first is preterm babies from 33 to 37 weeks. So they are born and you know very quickly they're put in the scanner and you measure the myelin along the tract and the myelin along the tract, and it's, it's pretty low. The second group is these late full-term babies. So these are the ones who sit around squatting in the room forever and never come out. Not that I'm bitter, but you know, my children were like that. And they have tons and tons of myelin there. So I, at least I feel good about that. So they're very heavily myelinated along this tract. And if you look at early full-term babies, they're kind of intermediate between the two. Now, this doesn't and if you look at this um, across all the tracts, this general pattern is seen across all the tracts in the human baby brain. Now, this is not surprising, right? You're expecting this myelin to increase as children get older. So this in itself was just a sort of proof of concept that they could measure the increase of myelination with age. The real, right, again, you can see here, the preterms, very little myelin, the late full term, lots of myelin, and the early full term, intermediate amounts. Now the interesting that what the interesting thing is now is they're going to look at a particular kind of idea of development. So one is that myelin just increases as a function of gestational age, time since um, conception. So it's kind of doesn't matter whether you're in utero or ex utero. A second model is that you know you're born and then you have this visual experience and that drives myelination because of, you know, you've got this experience, you might get faster ex utero development of myelin. And the third is, is that when you're born, you generally lose about 10% of your body weight. And so that might influence myelin and you might get slower ex utero development. Or there might be something about being born that slows ex utero development. So in that case, you've got a model where your myelin is, you've got one slope describing the in utero age and even a second slope describing the age after utero. In this case, B2 is greater than B1 if the myelin accelerates after birth. If myelin slows down after birth, then B2 is less than B1. Hopefully that's clear, should be clear. Um, so here we have the data. And so I'm gonna move this so I can see my bar. So let's start again with the preterms at birth. And once again, what they're finding is, is, is that, you know, get very little myelination, that's a solid line. If you're preterm at birth, that fits the data set you had before. If you look at the dotted lines, this is a full term at birth. So once again, you get lots of myelin if it's full term at birth, that's what you expect. The really interesting condition is where you have preterm babies at the same age as the full term babies. So they're born, they wait a bit, they wait till 47 weeks or 45, 45 weeks or whatever it is that matches the full term birth and they measure it. And what you can see for this dash line is it's intermediate between, it's not the same as the, the full term births. It's lower than that. So they're looking kind of intermediate between the preterm and the first term babies. And so that's really strong evidence for the second model that after birth, the rate of myelin decreases. And in fact, what's interesting, so that's the equation, so B3 is lower than B2 by a pretty significant factor. And what's interesting is this really simple model explains all the differences in myelination between the, um, between the babies who are born premature and the babies who are born at term. So this has, as you can imagine, you know, this probably doesn't apply to children who are born really, really early preterm, but it has pretty important clinical, we don't know how far this goes, but it has pretty important clinical implications for um, premature birth. It's a really interesting model. I was really excited when he said, like, do you have anything cool? And he sent me this. And I was like, and I was like, you know, and you go to somebody's office and you're like, that is really cool. That's what I do with this. I love that study. Okay. So my second case study, this is not the UW one. Um, and it, 
after Ariel's study, this might be my second favorite study. I really love Ariel's study, but this is a study by Yu Ji Tong. Um, and this is about resting state. So with the kind of increase in data sharing, there's been a real increase in interest in um, using resting state, because the idea is, is that you can kind of measure neural connectivity in the brain, but it's not you know, related to a specific task. And so it's much easier to sort of share data across different data sets and so on and so forth. But as we all know, the resting state signal is seriously confounded with a bunch of other things that are not neural signals. So you have cardiac, you have respiration and harmonics. Um, um, and so the, the, these things like respiration and harmonics and cardiac are pretty easy to filter out. You can, um, at the center, we can, you know, you, you can either filter them out by just removing those frequencies, or you can actually specifically measure them and regress them out um, using something like a cardiac monitor or something like that. The problem is, is that the, in the same frequency band as the neural signals, there are these kind of low frequency oscillations that don't seem to be of neural origin. Um, so if you take a classic resting state study, so you have someone lying in the scanner, they have their eyes open, they think about nothing, which I've never been able to think about nothing. That, that term means nothing to me. But anyway, they lie in the scanner, they think about whatever they're thinking about. And then what you do is you take the principal components of that data. These are independent components, which is like a principal components analysis, um, but a bit fancier. You get these sort of classic networks. So these are brain regions that tend to respond together. And you know, one classic one is the default mode network. So these regions tend to light up together, fluctuate in, in concert, or you have the auditory network that tends to fluctuate in concert and so on and so forth. So this is kind of standard data. You probably are pretty familiar with it. So what Yuin Chi Tong did is very, very simple. He simply put a um, infrared um, some um, light sensor on the finger. So he could measure the bulb response in the finger. So he's kind of measuring this and he's measuring basically blood oxygenation levels in the fingers. And he gets a time course that looks like this. And then he takes that signal and he correlates it with every voxel in the brain. And for every voxel, he finds the best fitting phase and amplitude with that pulse in the finger. And then what he does is he creates a fake signal. And this fake signal is basically this finger signal delayed by the amount of delay for each voxel and scaled by the amplitude that he needs. So he's removed any neural signal whatsoever from this data set. The only signal you have is the signal from the finger delayed and scaled. And when you do that, you get and then he does the same analysis as you normally use to get your sort of default, your networks. And I think you can see that this is really disquietingly similar, right? That, you know, if I showed, presented you those two data sets without labels, you would struggle to know which was the real data and which was the fake data. And what that shows you is that these um, low frequency oscillations, which have a variety of origins, I'm not gonna go into that, are a really big part of the signal. Um, but I would say, and so they dominate a traditional resting state signal. Um, and so that's concerning. It says, well, then are we just simply measuring plumbing? We're just measuring these signals that are just flowing through the system. Um, I would say you don't have to despair. Not all is lost. Um, people are working really hard on how to kind of factor out these low frequency oscillations. Um, I'm going to talk about the method that I really like because I think it's there's a lot of physics people who are trying to affect the problem. This way of doing it, I think, is very intuitively straightforward. So I, I like that. So this is based on the idea that these low frequency oscillations pass through the brain pretty slowly. So this is a map here on the right. Uh, how am I doing time? <laughs> um, this is a map of the brain where our low frequency oscillations are passing from kind of passing through the brain. And what you can see is it's taking about 4.8 seconds across for these signals to pass through the brain. And even at seven in the morning, my brain works a little faster than that. So the connections between neural signals are likely to be you know, within a second. So that's kind of how you can kind of separate out the two, that the connections between the time 
the time difference between two voxels that are connected are going to be in the order of milliseconds if it's a neural connection that is causing them to oscillate together. And it's going to be in the order of seconds if it's a low frequency oscillation. And so what essentially um, they suggest is you measure systematic fluctuation. You basically extract the time course from the superior sagittal sinus. So that's kind of an area that's probably not quite dominated with the neural signal. Can cross correlate with every voxel, determine the magnitude and time shift, the high correlation of each voxel. You may refine the regressor because this low, these low frequency oscillations, they kind of morph as they go through the brain. And then you basically keep going through the brain until you've removed all all of the signal that's passing kind of slowly through the brain. And what you're left is the signals that are passing quickly through the brain. Um, and then again, this is, you can find code for doing that here. All right, I'm gonna move to the third study. And this is quantitative MRI. This is my stuff. Um, reveals expansion of auditory cortex as a result of early blindness. And this data is um, hot off the lab. Um, so traditionally in MRI, um, what we do is we sort of take a single measurement that is weighted towards a particular MRI parameter. For example, proton density, longitudinal and transverse relaxation time, or susceptibility effects. And these are images that you're all very familiar with. There's now a shift, um, especially in research, um, towards, and again, this is driven by the fact that we can now collect data much more quickly than we could, to, um, towards what's called quantitative MRI. And what that's doing is essentially measuring the T1 and the T2 curves at multiple points. So you have a, me a measure of the curve. And so now what you actually have is a measure of T1. So one over T1 is R1. And you have a measure of you know, T2 star, one over which is R2 star. And, and you can have a measure. So you can actually get the absolute values of these quantities rather than just a T1 weighted image. Right, And that's really nice for consistency across different scanners, for example. And it also provides images, as you can see, with much higher contrast. So you're doing this by essentially measuring multiple points along the T1 curves and the T2 curves. OK. Um, I just explained that, so I'll skip it. So one example of that um, is the T1, um, the R1 measure. Um, is thought is one over, it's one over the T1 value, the absolute T1 value. And what you can see here in my cited controls here um, on the left is that these R1 values, and it's not clear whether they're driven by iron or myelin. People say it's myelin. It might also be iron. But what we do know is that these R1 values are much higher in our primary sensory areas. So there you can see occipital cortex. that has got these really high R1 values. You can see auditory cortex. It has these really high R1 values. And somatosensory motor cortex is just lighting up like a Christmas tree. I should be studying that area. It's clearly a good area to study. So the second graph I hear I have is my blind subjects. These are congenitally blind subjects. And as you might expect, they, they spend a lot of attention. They spend a lot of time listening to things. So that's their primary way of kind of navigating the world. And what's really beautiful here is you see this real expansion of these R1 values in auditory cortex, um, which kind of makes you think like, oh, is this actually an expansion of their primary sensory areas, given that this myelin seems to be so heavily associated with primary sensory areas here? And this is the statistical different map, and you can see that this difference between um, early blind and sighted um, is significant. Um, so, you know, and so that's really exciting for us. And this is just the beginning, but now what we can do is look and see, well, okay, let's look at the tonotopic organization of auditory cortex. Has that expanded to fill the space that has been taken up with this increased myelin? Like what, what, what's happening functionally in this area that's making it look like sensory cortex? So very excited. Invite me back in two years. Third case study. I'm going to talk about is um, quantitative MRI. Um, this is a study by a new faculty member in linguistics. Again, I've tried to focus on junior faculty. And this is interested in people with um, developmental language delays. In specific, he's interested in stuttering. Um, and so here I'm going to talk about this graph here. So some of you may have noticed we have this thing called this empty weighted image here. And this is kind of 
may be unfamiliar to many of you. Certainly was to me. I went away on sabbatical. And when I came back, all my students were showing me MT weighted images. And it was like, what? What is this thing? <laughs> what has happened while I'm gone? Um, so our traditional model of MRI is very, very simple. So we have this free pool of mobile protons that are in water or blood. And what we're measuring in any moment in time is the longitudinal mag magnetization. Our measurements are affected by the longitudinal magnetization over time, uh, the rate at which it's relaxing, and we measure it at a certain key value. And this transverse um, dephasing for these mobile protons in water is pretty slow. It's kind of on the order of tens of milliseconds, right? Don't take these numbers to be precise, but you know, we're talking tens of milliseconds. But there's a sort of Cinderella in the room, in the brain. And that is the restrict mobile pro proton, immobile protons. Hang on, I'm just gonna move this so I can see what I'm looking at. These are immobile protons that are bound to macromolecules, non-aqueous tissues. So a lot of this is myelin, but it's also other stuff as well. And these, this, this stuff is just like the, the mobile protons except for one really, really important difference, which is that the T2 of this stuff is incredibly fast. It's in tens of microseconds. And so that means this stuff is normally invisible to MRI because if you have a, T, um, a TE that's in the tens, measured in the tens of milliseconds, this stuff is already defaced by the time you take the measurement. So you can't see it at all. It's invisible. So the idea of magnetic um, transfer is that you can see this stuff. You can't ever measure it directly, though some people are working on it, but you can measure it by the influence it has on the free pool. So these immobile protons actually dephase the mobile ones. So, and the mobile ones also dephase the immobile ones, but you can't measure that because remember, the restricted pool is invisible to our measurements. But we can measure this KRF, the effect of the restricted pool on the free pool. And so what this is is kind of, basic idea of a standard pulse, what you have is an excitation pulse. This excitation pulse um, is targeted towards the free pool. And then you kind of get your echo and you measure it. And the idea is, is that when you take a measurement like this, you're measuring not only the free pool, but the effect of the restricted pool on the free pool. And then what we do is a second kind of pulse. This is called an MT scan, in which we use a really um, broadly frequency tuned excitation pulse because these macromolecules that remember are not free water so they don't have the same for resonance frequency as water so we're going to use a much broader set of resonance frequencies that are not targeted towards water it's kind of stealing a trick from the um, spectroscopy field this really broad um, pulse to saturate in the longitudinal direction a pulse to dephase in the um, transverse direction and then we essentially knock out the restricted pool so it can no longer have an influence on the free pool. And so at the end of this, we get a measurement of um, the magnetic properties of the free pool in the absence of the restricted pool. So we, we, we've, we sent Cinderella to bed. And so what you essentially have is the measure of magnetic transfer is this MO minus MS over MO. Um, MS, OMO is signal intensity without the restricted pool magnetization, MS is signal intensity with restricted pool magnetization. And you can also, if you're doing quantitative MRI, you can get kind of the absolute value, which is the degree to which, basically it's a measure of the degree to which the restricted pool is influencing the magnetization of the free pool. And that gives you a measure essentially of, in your voxel, how much of the material in that voxel is Cinderella material, is restricted pool, for example, myelin. And so this is an example of using this. Um, so again, this probably is a measure of myelin primarily, depending on area. This is an example of quantitative MRI um, in these children with developmental language delays. And what you can see is there are these regions that are showing statistical differences between children with developmental language delays and neurotypical controls. In particular, the left and right caudate nucleus. The orange is the children with developmental language delays. Um, the, the green is the typical DNA developing children. And what they found, in fact, is there's these, these magnetic transpiration saturation effects in the caudate nucleus were correlated with the language proficiency of these children. 
So a nice example of using this novel technique in a kind of clinical application. And I'm going to finally finish. We're going to go two few minutes over, but not by much, um, by talking about where I think we're going to go in the next 10 years, which is that we're going to go from having these sort of values that sort of measure tissue properties, but still really in terms of how they're, they're, they're measured in terms of magnetic physics towards models that essentially say, okay, I'm going to take all these different measurements and I'm going to say, okay, what is in my voxel? that means that I get these measurements, these values across all these different measurements. So basically a kind of linear fitting of myelin, iron, orientation fiber direction, and the ratio and the kind of the size of the myelin sheath compared to the fibers. And so what we're gonna to get to is actual kind of tissue properties um, of the underlying tissue. And I think we're gonna see that in the next, yeah, I mean, at least five or 10 years. And with that, I'm gonna very quickly pass back to John. Uh, okay, so I think we, uh, Annie, I just wanted to end on a little bit about um, data sharing since it is a new NIH priority and there is a new NIH mandate about it. So I'm just going to talk real briefly about that and some of the tools that are available um, to you as clinicians and researchers um, to, to facilitate that if you might not be aware. Um, so next slide, Ioni. So kind of the first problem is a general problem of collaborating with neuroimaging data. So neuroimaging data is complicated, it's large, it has these specific pipelines. So researcher A has some pipeline involving software and researcher B has some pipeline involving other software. And there's a real bottleneck between collaboration between those researchers um, or using data sets from different large studies even trying to translate those pipelines or the format of the data back and forth um, between each other. So that, that's an issue. Um, and it's an issue we um, need to solve because next slide, uh, NIH, as you probably um, know, has now effective this January, a new data, data management and sharing policy. Uh, next slide, which uh, requires um, scientific and data management and sharing plans be submitted and evaluated on an ongoing basis for any extramural grants, uh, contracts, or extramural research projects. And uh, more specifically, if you dig into the nitty gritty, um, NIH is now telling us data must be shared regardless if it supports publication or not, and should be shared as soon as possible, at least by the time the publication, by the time of publication, or by the end of the award period, whichever comes first. Uh, while not all data generated during the project should be shared, Broad data sharing is encouraged, including data supported in replication and no results that may not be published. So plans should maximize appropriate data sharing. So how do we do that with um, MRI? Because, uh, next slide, Annie. Um, MRI is really big, and we described neuroimaging techniques like multiband and these advanced diffusion techniques. Our data has actually gotten a lot larger than it was even um, 10 years ago or even five years ago. So now we're talking about potentially gigabytes of data uh, per individual subject and also the number of, and the number of subjects we have in lots of studies um, going up. So we have both challenges on the data acquisition side and the data management side. Um, so we have this NIH priority, um, but we also have a lot, a lot of opportunity um, as well, because now this data is going to be shared by mandate um, amongst researchers. That is a great opportunity for that data to be reused, either in large data sets or small data sets um, across multiple different labs and, and universities. But that reuse can really only happen if we are managing our data proper uh, in a way that allows reuse to be um, facile between different groups. Um, so real briefly, I just want to finish on one of the main ways that we are doing that in the neuroimaging community, and that is the brain imaging data structure or the BID standard, when, which probably a number of you are already familiar with. So the BID standard is basically a simple and intuitive way to organize, describe neuroimaging and behavioral data. Uh, this was originally developed um, um, at Stanford, but now there is a large community of BIDs and a steering group um, and a very active community in organization, organization of human brain mapping, for example, um, that maintains the specification and adapts it and updates it and makes sure that it's working well for the community. Um, Simply, it's a way to organize um, your, your data, so both your DICOM data, whether you're doing uh, MRI, um, BIDS also is available for uh, ECOG data, for 
which is of course interested in you in neurosurgery, um, EEG, MEG, um, number basically any modality for neuroimaging bids is um, trying to come up with this, a standard form. And the basics of that standard is just organizing, it's pretty intuitive, like organizing stuff in directories that make sense in terms of files, and then using metadata in the form of JSON files or sidecars to explain what the data in the directory are. And that includes both the neuroimaging data that's collected, or if you're running an experiment that might have behavioral components, what that behavioral data is as well, and the design of your experiment um, uh, presentation and things like that. So the idea is that if you have an experiment, um, an fMRI experiment, for example, in the bids format, uh, you can basically just take that data and you should be able to pretty well understand what exactly happened and what the results were from that experiment. And moreover, you can then potentially do some on automatic processing on it. So next slide. And that opens up what's called the bids app universe. So this is, I think, kind of the cool part. So the first part is sharing and making sure we understand what the data we're sharing is. But once we have data in a standardized format, that allows us to do potentially automatic stuff with it. So there is um, what are called bids apps, and these are essentially Docker containers for the uh, kind of cloud computing savvy among you, um, which allows bids data, if it's in the proper format and validated, to be processed in numerous ways. So you can do things like quality control or pre-processing or automatic processing for diffusion imaging um, or a pattern classifier, a number of different uh, things and new uh, tools being developed every day that kind of are building this app universe that's going to allow and facilitate um, reuse of data. Um, so the last thing we'll mention is that, uh, at least in our view at the Center for Human Neuroscience, um, and I think widely in the community is being adopted, is that to help you as clinicians and researchers comply with this mandate from NIH and also to share your data and uh, um, um, use other folks' data, that we want to make it easy for you at the beginning. So that means starting at your either your research MRI center or data collection for MEG or whatever you might be doing um, to kind of start with this, with it in mind that in the end, when you publish your manuscript, you're also going to have to publish um, your data. And at least in neuroimaging, the main repository for if you're imaging data, which is open neuro, requires your data to be in bits format. So we start on our MRI console um, by naming things in a bids compliant way. And then we use a data management system called Flywheel. And this is, you know, you don't have to do it this way. There are homegrown versions as well, but um, this is the way that the CHN does it. And Flywheel allows that data to be pushed to the cloud and then essentially with one very easy process converted to bids format. And then once it's in bids format, we can also run automatically quality control, pre-processing a number of other different things. Um, so putting your data in that format to begin with means that once you're, it should be much easier as you do your analysis to keep it in that format. And then finally, when you get to the point when you're going to publish, uh, hopefully it should be an easy or easier step for you to push it up to Open Neuro or the repository of your choice, uh, as you're probably going to have to do um, uh, when your paper is published. So that's kind of one of the new frontiers in terms of things we have to do, but also the great opportunity um, because there's going to be a huge amount more data out there and a huge amount of data that we can look at and investigate um, without having to collect and potentially compare to data that's collected locally um, or at other sites. So hopefully that's a, a useful kind of just quick introduction to that. Um, and I think that's it. Do we have anything else, Annie?